Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, Downing Street has warned there'll be difficult decisions on public spending after Liz Truss insisted she wouldn't make any cuts to help balance the books. The Prime Minister has faced further questions about how she'll pay for promises of tax cuts in the recent mini-budget. The economist Lord Jim O'Neill told LBC the Bank of England is likely to push up the cost of borrowing again. Obviously, if they raise rates sharply, which right now seems to me most likely about what they're going to do, uh, they're going to get a lot of flack for that, and it is going to really hurt a lot of people that, that borrow, including the government mm. and, of course, highly leveraged consumers. But frankly, that is the situation the government has put them in. It is spectacularly naive. Thames Valley Police, searching for a 19-year-old woman who went missing in 2019, have identified human remains during forensic examinations at an address in Milton Keynes. Leah Croucher was last seen on CCTV about half a mile away. Marks & Spencer is to speed up a major shake-up of its stores. Nearly 70 larger shops will close, while the retailer will open more than 100 food outlets. The Rugby Football Union has confirmed WASPs have been suspended from the Premiership. The club says it's likely to go into administration in the coming days. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed down 59 points at 68.26. The pound buys $1.11 and €1.14. LBC weather, rain becoming confined to southern and southeastern England overnight and northwest Scotland. Tomorrow, some rain in southern England and parts of Scotland, a high of 17 degrees. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Andy Ivey. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross-question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. Welcome to Wednesday's Cross Question. Uh, with me in the studio, we have David Simmons, Conservative MP for Ryslip, Northwood and Pinner. Rachel Maskell, Labour MP for York Central. Emily Carver, columnist for Conservative Home. And Adam Biankov, political editor for Byline Times. As I say, they're here to take your calls. The number 0345 6060 973. You can text your question to 84850. And if you have Alexa, just say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC and your question will appear as if by magic on my screen and of course you can watch us on global player call 0345 6060 973 tweet at lbc text 84850 cross question with ian dale this is lbc Right, let's crack on with our first caller. It's Martin in Doncaster. Martin, hello. What would you like to ask? Hi, Ian. Yeah, do the panel believe Liz Trust when when she said there'd be no spending cuts? Rachel Maskell. Well, the the Prime Minister might have said that at Prime Minister's question time today, but if you were listening to the Treasury Select Committee earlier in the day, she's going to have to make a decision because there isn't enough money. So she's either going to have to reverse that emergency budget of the 23rd of September, which she has also denied that she's going to play a part in, or she is going to start making those cuts to the public services that we desperately need at this time. But she can't do nothing. And at the moment, it sounds like she's denying that she's going to take any interventions whilst expecting the markets to provide confidence, which is the one thing they don't have at the moment. And of course, with the Bank of England's announcement that they're going to end their refinancing programme um, in, in buying up the, the government bonds. That means that um, there's more vulnerability we can expect next week in the markets. And of course, that's going to put her into an even tighter situation. So she's going to have to make a decision. Does she reverse those tax cuts or does she then go for cuts to public but services? She was quite categoric in PMQs today, wasn't she? She was. When she was yeah. asked, will you, cu will you cut? And she... And I can't remember exactly what, how Keir Starmer phrased the question, but she said, absolutely, absolutely, there won't be spending cuts. Now, I suppose she left a bit of wiggle room saying, well, overall, there won't be cuts in the amount of public spending, but that doesn't mean that they can't shift resources from between departments, does it? But the scale of the cuts you're talking about, if you don't cut defence and if you don't cut the NHS budget, that means all the other departments are going to have to lose about a third of their budgets. This is the kind of scale. And my concern is the way that the Prime Minister answered that question is that she simply does not understand what's going on economically around her. And I think that's the likely scenario now. I mean, frankly, if you're going to cut government expenditure, 
the DWP budget is where you look first, isn't it? And obviously that would affect some of the most vulnerable in society. And especially at this time when the cost of living crisis is really biting mm. on those individuals. Um, they are so dependent on seeing a proper increase now in pensions as well as, of course, other forms of social security. If they're going to be losing that vital <coughs> amount of income, those people will be pushed further into poverty. And of course, what does that mean? The food banks are already running out of food. Um, they won't be even paying their subsidised heating. It means that people will be cold and hungry this winter. That's the reality we're facing. David Simmons. Well, this year we've had war in Europe, we've had a new Prime Minister, we've had a new monarch, so I'm not going to make predictions about what's going to happen even in a few weeks' time. But it's clear the British government is sharing the pain of governments all across the developed world. The decisions by the US to raise interest rates and the economic situation that's been triggered by Putin's invasion of Ukraine means that we've all got a set of financial problems that we're wrestling with. Uh, to the big picture question, can the government manage spending cuts or can it maintain the current level of spending? Now, we know in every budget, government starts to spend less on some things and more on other things. Maybe Liz Truss is a secret Keynesian. What she's saying is we're going to borrow in order to reduce the pain that voters will feel and then look to bring it back into balance over the longer term. But in my view, as a, a backbench member of parliament, I want to give her the benefit of the doubt and give the government the benefit of the doubt. We've seen some ideas that have come forward already. We know what the timeline is, for example, on benefit decisions to be made the same time as every year when we have the information that we need to make those decisions properly. So I'm going to give her the room to come forward and say, this is what we think adds up to a package that we can all work with well, in the interests of our people. I mean, I'm sure you do want to give her the benefit of the doubt, but that's more than your constituents probably want to do at the moment, judging by the opinion polls. And how can you give her and the Chancellor the benefit of the doubt after their, um, as I termed it, trust a shambles of a mini budget? Because that that is what has spooked the markets. There's nothing else. This has happened in this country. It's not. There's no other country that's experiencing this kind of turbulent market turbulence at the moment. And there are only two people to blame for that. One lives in number 10, one lives in number 11. Well, the UK, as we know, is experiencing this in the context where the wider world is experiencing a lot of the same challenges. And I think it's very clear that the handling of the, the mini budget, the fiscal event, is not something that's landed well with the financial markets. And the government's acknowledged it's got some work to do to convince people that that plan is sustainable. But I'm willing them to give them the time and space to do that. I don't want to see us to return to a situation where interest rates are rising to the point where my constituents are really worried about paying. Well, the they cost. already are. And we need to make sure that we, we get ahead of it. How can you give them the benefit of the doubt when interest rates today, or mortgage rates, are the highest they've been since the financial crash of 2008? How can you give them the benefit of the doubt? I think we recognise that the reason interest rates are at that level is because of decisions made in other countries over which we no. have no direct influence. No, we don't recognise that therefore we, at all. I, I think it's, it's very clear the, the US bond rate is the thing that determines what goes on in terms of the rest of the Are interest rates like this in France and Germany? The answer is no, they're not. Well, yeah. they, they're certainly rising across the developed world. And I think in the case of the UK, we were a bit behind the curve and have now done a bit of catching up. But we need to recognise that every day we're seeing some interest rates, for example, around mortgage offers being taken out of the market and other ones coming back to the market. As somebody who used to be a mortgage advisor, that was something I know happens every single day as providers bring new new products to the market. Yeah, but so they, we need they, to make they sure they don't that drop this out at the rate of forty percent in one day, do they? And that was a direct result of what the Chancellor did in that mini budget. There, there was no there were no world it, there was no world impact there. That was strictly down to what he said. Yeah, I, say, I think the messaging that came out of that was unclear. I think people were asking questions about how clear is the government strategy and what the impact is going to be. And certainly from people in the financial world that I've spoken to, they felt that they were getting mixed messages. So if the government can really demonstrate that it's got those messages lined up, that it brings the confidence that the whole thing was intended to bring back to consumers in this country by putting a bit more money in people's pockets, especially the lowest income people's pockets, then that will be a good thing for our country. And I'm going to give them the time and space to do that. Well, you're a cool customer, David Simmons, mm. failing to get ruffled by any questions <laughs> there. But, um, Emily, yes. um, what's your view? I mean, what have you been writing about on Conservative Home and all of this? Well, I've been writing about the communication strategy or lack of one in terms of I communicating free months. market ideas which tend to be complex and often counterintuitive and you need to be able to sell them to the ordinary man and woman on the street and I don't believe that the government are doing that very well and in some cases they haven't even tried um, and that is quite frustrating for those who do believe that um, our economy has been under too high a tax burden for a long, long time and that regulations could be cut in places for the benefit of our economic prosperity and the benefit for 
people. I think in terms of how she's going to cut public spending or whether she's going to do, I think what she'll do is keep them as they are and then inflation will eat into those budgets. So in real terms, it'll be a real terms cut. But let's also remember the huge amount of money, and this is something that Labour... Um, uh, seems to agree with this, at least the government spokesperson does. I don't know if Keir Starmer has actually admitted that he agrees with the amount of money that's being pledged to freeze energy bills. That is a huge spending pledge, so that may well keep public spending above what it was. We are spending at crisis levels. We have been, of course, with the pandemic, but public spending has continued over years and years to rise. Our economic growth has been stagnant. Wages have been stagnant um, to a large degree at the same time. So I do uh, share Liz Truss's overall aim of getting a a country that has a lower tax burden and lower regulation. But I do think the communication and the handling of it, getting the party on side, getting the country on side, has been, I must say, appalling. Adam Biankov, what's your view? Well, I think you have to listen to the what she actually said in the House of Commons, which was that there won't be a reduction in government spending. She didn't say there won't be cuts to public services. And in the lobby briefing with the Prime Minister's spokesman afterwards, it quickly became very clear that what she was talking about was the overall level of government spending. Mm. But he did say that there will be difficult choices that need to be made on public services. So the fact that we are spending so many tens of billions of pounds on bill, uh, subsidies for energy bills, that, that is the vast majority of the increase that we're seeing in government spending. So that, that doesn't change the fact that there are going to be... Either she's going to have to reverse her um, tax cuts, which... We've seen some indication that she may be going down that route. Um, the Treasury are looking again at some of the measures that they've announced. Or she's going to have to make massive cuts to uh, public services. The IFS suggesting it could be in, in, the, in the region of £60 billion. Um, Where do you think those cuts are likely to come? Where do I think they're likely yeah. to come? Well, I think it's, uh, as Rachel said, I think it's likely it'd be very hard for them to make those cuts to the NHS, for example, or to defence. Truss has committed to raising spending on, on defence. So then it le you're looking at a kind of across-the-board cut of around a third to all the other government departments. And they could try and sort of take that's, more out. That's unthinkable. Given yes, given the amount of cuts there have been over the last mm. 12 years to government departments, yes. I mean, you look at um, D DCLG or whatever it's called, Department for Leveling Up now, um, over 40% of their budget has gone over so are they i mean i wouldn't have thought there was a lot of fat to trim there no and it would lead to certain public services effectively ceasing to function so logistically it'd be very difficult to find those cuts politically i think it's completely impossible for her to find those get rid of may, national, get rid of highways england that'd be first on my list may i just say that reversing the tax cuts would be a fraction of the budget of the government it would not really make much of a difference to balancing um you know the budget um, it's that huge spending well, it would be on about the billion, energy it? that is absolutely massive. And may I also say it's quite important to look at you know what the opposition are proposing because it seems to me that they basically agree with the whole package besides the corporation tax that hasn't hadn't been hiked anyway, the reversal on that and the stamp duty cut. Seems that they're all on board with you know the income tax um, reduction well, and, and well, so just, on and just so forth. The top rate of tax. Just on that, on the on the one. That's been reversed reduction. anyway. There's been very mixed messages coming out from your front bench on the 1p reduction in income tax. Where do you stand on that? Well, clearly we have to look at right across the board, but we know that we need a more proportionate system, and that's why saying that we would ensure that the top rate of tax was maintained at that 45p um, in the pound, but also ensuring that people on low incomes are taken out of tax. Of course, it's really important at a time when so many people are struggling. But the, the cost 1P, of living what would you do is increasing. Well, on, on the 1P, I mean, I think that is absolutely right, that people aren't having to pay that additionality at the moment when they've got all of these other costs which they are going to have to face. So, but the problem is that Jonathan Ashworth, who speaks on DWP matters, he said that the Labour Party was committed to reversing that 1p ta mm -hmm. tax cut. Mm -hmm. And yet, Jonathan, I think it was Jonathan Reynolds, I may be wrong, but somebody else on the front bench said exactly the opposite yesterday. And I have yet to find out what mm -hmm. the official line is. Well, um, I I, my understanding us. was with, with Jonathan Ashworth that uh, we were going to be taking that mm. um, back. So, um, yeah. OK, let's move on in a moment. 0345 6060 973, if you have a question to put to our panel. You're watching and listening to LBC's Cross Question with me, Ian Dale. It's quarter past eight. This is LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 18 minutes past eight on LBC. Rachel Maskell, David Simmons, Emily Carver and Adam Biankoff with us answering your calls. 0345 6060 973. Let's go to Robin in Whitehaven. Hello, Robin. Good evening. Um, my question is for the panel is um, should the Conservative Party remove Liz Truss and replace her with Rishi Sunak? Um, and do you think that would steady the market, someone more competent? Do, do you not think it's a little bit early to ask that kind of question? She's only been in office for a month. Um, no, I don't, I don't think it is because we've got two years up until the general election and we've seen, what, we've seen what's happened in a matter of no time, the damage, and the markets don't look like they're steady in. So how long can it, how long can this go on? I, I really can't see Liz Trust being leading into the next election, so why not do it now? Act fast, try okay. to steady the markets. Um, Adam Biankov, do you think there's any chance of that sort of thing happening? Well, up until now, it, I would have answered no. I don't think there's any chance of the Conservatives getting rid of a leader after three or four weeks. But looking at the response of Conservative MPs today at Prime Minister's Questions, where they looked incredibly glum, and at 1922 committee, where people were sort of look, walking out in a state of utter de depression, um, I think that, that there are some Conservative MPs now who are starting to think, you know, this really can't go on. Uh, the party are 30 points behind in the polls. Um, one poll uh, this week suggested that the Conservative Party are now 21 points behind on the question of which party is best able to manage the economy. And throughout this period that the Conservatives have been in government, that's been the kind of ace in the deck of the Conservative, of the Conservative mm. Party, is that they are seen, no matter how unpopular they may be in other areas, that's the one thing that's kind of kept them afloat, is that they are seen as, as more capable of managing the economy. And once you've lost that as a party and as a government, it's incredibly hard to, to get it back. And look, you know, things are bad at the moment, but they're only going to get worse for the government over the coming... We've talked about the... the potential public sector cuts, um, the economy, we're going into a, a potentially a really deep recession. Um, is Liz Truss capable of turning that around? I think the evidence we've seen so far is that she's not. But I mean, the, the optics, though, of yeah. removing yet another female leader, I mean, the Tories crow that they've got three female leaders and Labour haven't had any, but if they get rid of Liz Truss, they've toppled all three of them. Well, it's a lose-lose situation, isn't it? I mean, if they if they stay with Liz Truss, then they're going down to a very bad defeat at the next general election. If they get rid of her, it looks terrible, it makes them look indecisive, and they're probably going to go down to a defeat at the next general election. So they've got to choose the kind of least worst option. Um, and as things stand, it's difficult to see how she turns it around. And I think Conservative MPs, they're reluctant at the moment to, to do anything because, as they say, it would look, make them look ridiculous to change a leader so soon. But I think it's inevitably that it's going to, if things get worse, and I think they are going to get worse, it, the question is going to come up, well, what are we going to do? Are we really going to go into an election where some polls suggest we could lose all but a dozen of our MPs? I don't think that's going to happen. Um, Emily Carver, David Simmons said, well, give her a chance, give her the benefit of the doubt for the moment. Another Conservative MP said to me a few days ago, uh, you've got to give her three months, and if the opinion polls are still 20 or 30 points behind in three months' time, that is game over. Do you think that is where Conservative MPs are sort of heading in their thought process? Why three months seems arbitrary. I suppose it seems a bit It seems like a, a good amount of time to give someone. Well, she certainly needs to rally the troops. She's clearly not communicating what she's doing, why she's doing it, why she's doing it and how she's going to do it, clearly enough, to her party and, and the public, of course, as well as the polling suggests, are not in support of what's going on. And clearly with all the, the turmoil in the financial markets, people are very worried about their position, which is completely understandable. I do think, however, there is a cohort of people in this country who do like to give someone a chance um, to you know, get on with what they're trying to do and see what happens. Give them, you know, as you say, perhaps three months to test out their ideas. If it's still not working for them, then perhaps another another um, election is on its way. But I do think it would be absolutely ridiculous to oust her at this stage. It's far too early. Um, Rishi Sunak, for all his merits, may not even... Well, actually, he probably would want the job, wouldn't he? He would want it. In the current circumstances... 
We've heard a lot about communication tonight, but it's not really about communication, is it? It's about the, the policy. The policy is deeply unpopular. But if you're going to have a controversial policy, you need to be able to explain it, you need to be able to sell it, and she's not capable of doing that. It doesn't matter how you sell it. The fact that the the, the pound went to its lowest level in, in decades, the fact that people's mortgages are going through the well, roof... Well, hang on with the mortgages. That's... With the mortgages, if there were a Labour government, if any party were in government, interest rates would be going up. We've had a long Not period of inflation speed, now. The, the Bank scale. of England took its eye off the wheel, took its hands off the wheel, was asleep at the wheel, whatever the saying is, and did not make sure that it would, you know, incrementally raise interest rates. And that's why we're having this sort of, was, you know, it was rise. And they still of, haven't... Funded tax cuts, they still, which, uh, they still haven't raised them high enough. I mean, in the US, they raised them by 0.75 percentage points. That's what the markets were expecting. That was another thing that um, confused the markets a little. So it's not just the government that's the confused the markets. Okay, it's the David, Bank of England as well. David Simmons, let's go back to the question. Should the Conservative Party remove Liz Truss and put Rishi Sunak in place? I can't remember who you supported. I think if we'd been here in 1980 having this conversation, people would have said many of the same things about Margaret Thatcher because the economic turmoil that was faced, rising interest rates, all the rest of it were, were common factors. The fact is government's got 18 months to two years to plan for the next election. The strategy behind what was announced in the fiscal event was to make people feel that they were better off, to put more money in people's that worked pockets. Well. And you've got to bear in mind, those things haven't been implemented yet. So people haven't had a chance to feel whether there's any benefit. I, Emily is, is absolutely spot on the way she's described things. Some of those arguments have not been very well made. And clearly, we are feeling the effects of a global situation here in the UK. So it feels to me like we're in a situation where we need to give the government time, firstly, to show that it can deal with those external threats to the wealth and the well-being of people in the UK. And also that those policies, the tax cuts, which have not yet been implemented, the reduction in national insurance, which hasn't yet fed through, that they will begin to work their effect, they'll work their way through so that people will come towards that next election and say, we had our doubts at the time, but what this has demonstrated is that the Conservatives once again have shown that they can make people in this country wealthier, better. Well, they might awesome. say that we're paying a little bit less tax by the time of the next election, but that is more than compensated for by the extra £400 a month we're paying on our mortgage. I mean, people won't feel better off, will they? Well, we're making an assumption there about what's going to happen, oh, what people are paying there. <laughs> and, and we know, you know, the worst case scenario, if you come off a very cheap mortgage deal and can only go on to a very high standard variable rate, is that you will be facing a big rise. But clearly, a lot of these things are things that are some time ahead. Now, we know what's going on in the bond market is interfering, is, is affecting mortgage rates. And I think, as Emily said, there's a real question about whether the Bank of England has responded as well as, for example, the European Central Bank did previously at settling those concerns down because that will feed through to real people's incomes and household budgets. But we need to give sufficient time for those things to be felt so that real human beings looking at their wage packets, looking at their mortgage bills, looking at their energy costs can see what that means. The wholesale costs of gas, the wholesale cost of electricity is coming down, prices at the pumps are stabilising. So there are positive things that are happening in the system as well. And no, that's prices really at the pumps aren't stabilising. They've gone up about eight pence a litre over the past week. So, well, having fallen quite a long way, they've then gone up a little bit recently. Well, they've gone down the from about 195 to 179 and they're now back up to 187. And, and I would agree. That's I think not stabilising. I'd agree with most of your listeners. It's still too high and it has further to fall. But I think most people will watch on the news every night what's going on in Ukraine and will understand the impact that that's having on global supply chains will recognise that this is a difficult period for everybody. The UK government is working closely with our allies to try and take us through it and protect the situation of our people and our economy as I, best. I notice you haven't um, responded to my observation that I couldn't remember who you had voted for in the leadership. I, I, I supported Rishi Sunak. I was, was public about that. Would he wish to take over the role now? I haven't asked him about it, but uh, I suspect he would take the view that the government set out a course about creating a growth strategy for the economy. They've got to be given the chance for that to work its way through this. I mean, he hasn't said, I told you so yet, but he could, couldn't he? Well, the reality is, because of what's happening in the global situation, whoever is Chancellor, whoever is Prime Minister, would be dealing with the same set of problems. And the questions that we're, we're debating often, although it may seem to be very big political differences, broadly speaking, the Labour opposition are supportive of the energy package, they're supportive of the aim of the government to stabilise the situation in the economy. And I think the more that we can work together on those points, the more likely it is to bring that confidence back to the markets. Rachel. Well, we we just cannot deny the impact that the 23rd of September had on people's confidence in, in the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. And I think that has run its way through now, obviously, in people having to face those increased mortgages. And we haven't talked about pensions yet, but of course that's going to work its way through too. And that means workers ultimately having to pay more for a deferred benefit they get in their retirements. And of course, 
all of that's going to cause real pain to the household budget and people will be making their choices as they've already indicated in the polls that they don't just want a new prime minister they want a new government and and the sooner that we can bring that forward the better it is to bring that stabilisation across the economy, but also to give people the opportunity to get through this very trying period. And we've got to have before us the people that are struggling within our own constituencies at this time, and I'm sure David has got many in his eyes certainly have in mine, who are absolutely terrified at how they're going to pay those bills. They're now faced with increased mortgage costs on top of increased inflation and food prices. And of course, the energy package, which the government did put forward, and we are out of step with the government, didn't provide the protection that Labour would have put forward. So we're going to see an increase there. But also, the government hasn't set out how they're going to bring down those costs in the longer term around the investments that, for instance, but, but that the, Labour has Their package set was out. bigger than yours, if you forgive the expression. <laughs> um, I mean, they, they want to spend £150 billion over, I think, two years. Yours was only going to last six, six months. months. That's right, but it would be greater protection over that winter period, which, of course, is right well, They were providing protection over the next winter as well. Well, we haven't set out what we're going to do in the longer term, as was looking at the six-month period over the winter period, which is confronting people at this very moment, whilst also putting the investment in to the renewable energy and into retrofit, so we're consuming less in the longer term, but also taking energy from cheaper sources. Thank you very much. We'll come to more of your questions in just a moment on Cross Question. It's 8.30 on LBC. Let's get the latest news headlines from... Andy Ivey. Liz Truss has insisted she won't cut public spending to balance the books after the mini-budget. Economists and the financial markets continue to question her plans, while Labour leader Sakir Starmer has called her approach kamikaze. Detectives searching for missing teenager Leah Croucher have found human remains. Police are focusing their search on a house in Milton Keynes in Buckinghamshire, less than half a mile from where she was last seen in 2019. Britain's biggest police force is to start using behavioural data to predict which men will commit violence against women and girls. Met Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley says he wants the same techniques used to detect terrorists applied to other criminals. LBC weather, rain becoming confined to southern and southeastern England overnight. A few fog patches elsewhere. Tomorrow, some rain in southern England and parts of Scotland. Sunny spells elsewhere and a high of 17 degrees. This is LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.33, David Simmons, Rachel Maskell, Emily Carver and Adam Biankov with us taking your calls. And indeed texts. We have one from Andrew in Preston. Liz Truss identified vested interests dressed up as think tanks as forming part of the anti-growth coalition. Please ask the panel their thoughts on the vested interests of think tanks and why they are anti-growth. Um, well, Emily, you work for a think tank as well as writing for Conservative Home, don't you? Do you are you are you part of the anti-growth coalition? I don't think you could level that accusation at, at the IEA. We're very much pro-planning reform, which is one of the things that is holding back growth, particularly when it comes to housing, but also when it comes to renewables, um, which is something that I'm confused by reports that I've read recently about Liz Truss wanting to ban solar farms on farmland. Uh, surely that should be up to the farmer. So I'm a little bit confused over that. So that seems a little bit anti-growth. But um, think tanks like uh, like mine um, certainly are pro-growth and want to do as much as so possible. So you want planning reform. Um, wh who's funding your research on planning reform? I have no idea. But we do have a Who Funds You page if anyone is interested in looking. Does it, does it give much detail? It gives a little bit of detail, yes. What you need to know. What do you think we need to know? I don't know, really. What would you like to know? Well, I, would you like a list of every single well, donor from most, uh, ten from the beginning in 1955? No, but most think tanks do provide lists of the donors they get each year. And Actually, your, not your, really. Yours doesn't. Actually, not really, including uh, left-wing think tanks as well. Like who? Um, well, I don't think Oxfam, for example, as a charity, Is that a, think tank? a charity, we're an educational charity. charity. So, um, on that basis, I don't. You believe can't really liken the IEA to Oxfam, can you? We're an educational charity. There are different types of charity, of course, with different aims and different ways of uh, making a difference. Adam, um, what would you like to know? Educational charity. Well, you know, the, the agenda that Liz Truss has been pushing in her in her media budget, you know, lower, shrink the size of the state, and. Um, and uh, fund in order to get big tax cuts. That's something, an agenda that organisations like the Institute for Economic Affairs have been pushing for, for years, including at Conservative Party conference where they host a lot of events with ministers and where they boast that Liz Truss is, has been one of their most regular attendees at. And so I think it does matter who funds these organisations because often they appear, people from these organisations appear, you know, quite rightly on, on programmes like this. And there isn't the, the question of who is actually funding the, the positions that funding the, the research is your accusation is, is your accusation taking? with me sitting on this panel that somehow what I am saying is paid for because well, that is the incredible it's no surprise that someone who believes in uh, free markets in general might wish to work for a think tank that also um, believes yes, in that and it's no it's no coincidence that a politician like Liz Truss might be more interested in the Institute of Economic Affairs than she would be with a left wing think tank that's how things work it's and the reason why we protect we, we, we protect, know who those we protect are who are the privacy so of judgment. our donors because places like the Byline Times would go after them <laughs> Right? You yeah, know, people are allowed their privacy. It's a right. It's interesting if we look at Byline Times' shareholders, they're not so squeaky clean, are they, either? Max... We're paid for Mosley, by our... Mosley, is it? No, no. We are paid for Son by our subscribers. Son of an uh, actual by our fascist. We're entirely funded for, paid for by our subscribers. And and only people can 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 look at our, who our shareholders are. And people can and we put our subscribers on the front of our of our newspaper. People can't look at the IEA and see who funds them. Can't they can see, see a breakdown. They can see a breakdown. Some can't, of our donors there is no real breakdown. On the say say there where they're the, from. Say listeners by suggesting there is. Nobody can go on, on your website and see who funds your organisation. You can you see can't. where where proportionately the, the spending comes from, uh, the donations come from. What you does can that mean? Also proportionally, see, what does that mean? Can, can people go on your website? Fundamentally, and see we protect the privacy of our donors. So they can't? They can look at the proportion and also some of our donors well, do express proportion? that but, openly. But you, you have to understand that if you aren't transparent, and the, what was the saying, transparency is the best form of disinfectant, if you aren't transparent, then of course people are going to think the worst, aren't they? They're going to imagine that um, a fossil fuel company will have paid you to come out with a report which says something that happens to be quite obliging to them. Now. I've had dealings with think tanks on the left and right for probably 30 years, and I genuinely don't believe that that sort of thing goes on, that that, that you have paid... Well, that's against the law. You have paid for research. That's not that, what happens. That, no, exactly. 
but don't you see that you're kind of feeding into this narrative that it does happen and that's people suspect I would I would I would believe that if it weren't for the fact that the accusations that come our way are by people who fundamentally disagree with the ideology or the policy proposals of our think tank okay. so it is a politically motivated attack line pure um, and simple Max Mosley was an investor of Byline Times, wasn't he? Yes, a yeah. minor one, yeah. yeah minor I, mean, just, just, yeah. I mean, just to get that clear. Um, David, I don't know how, which think tanks you think are part of the anti-growth coalition. Liz Truss identified various... Well, she didn't actually name who they were in her conference speech. And I was left sort of slightly scratching my head because quite a few think tanks... Uh, I think she would think are uh, actually quite supportive of what she wants to do. Yeah, I, I'm a director of a think tank called Localis. You know, its website will tell you who funds it, but essentially it's about local government. We're quite interested in things like planning reform. Uh, and my experience as an MP is that think tank reports from left and right are extremely useful. And when we've got issues to debate, I mean, is the reduction in the 45p tax rate a good thing or not? Well, the last time we did it, of course, that produced more tax income for the government to fund public services. And it's helpful to have reports from different sides who are saying these are the the dilemmas that you have to consider as we face decisions like that. And on issues like planning reform, I think you'd be pretty naive to think somebody who's asking for major deregulation is going to be somebody who's not going to profit from that. But we also know we're in a country where both political parties agree there is a major housing shortage. We need to get building more homes fast. And therefore, all of those things, from whichever perspective, add something useful to that debate. So I, I welcome the fact that there's a huge tapestry of those organisations. I read their reports. I don't take any of them as gospel, but they are all helpful. Uh, Emily, how does it work? It's a genuine question. Do you come up with ideas for research that you want to do and then say to all of your donors, right, we'd like to do this research, who's going to come in I must and help admit, us fund it? I must admit, I don't work in the research team, nor do I work in the fundraising team. My job is in communication, so I but, don't. But there is a, I would not be able okay, to tell right, you with fair, accuracy fair enough, fair enough. how that function but th works. There is a difference between that and somebody coming to a think tank and saying, "I want to give you a hundred thousand pounds to fund research into this area." We, we, we'd quite like to sort of have this conclusion. I mean, I don't think that is what generally happens, but a lot of people do. And so you've got somebody on a text here I saw, and I saw you saw it on my screen a moment ago. Um, IEA is funded by the fossil fuel industry and tobacco firms, says somebody. Somebody else says it's funded by Russian money, Russian billionaires. That's why she won't tell you. Now, I don't believe that the IEA is funded by Russian billionaires, but the fact that you don't declare who your donors are leads people to imagine that And it's you absolutely are. in your right to ask that question. It's the policy of the organisation that I work for that we don't disclose donors' names without their asking. And the reason, so, the reason you don't do you ask them if they want to... to do, do you ask them if they want I to I don't work that? in that department, so I okay. genuinely do not know. You can take that up with uh, right. other members of the IA. Rachel. Well, transparency is absolutely essential to understand who is in providing the influence i mean obviously out of the we were just talking about the the uh, fiscal event on the 23rd of september there were people that gained out of that and of course the associations that are then made if there isn't transparency in us setting out exactly who the chancellor was speaking to who the prime minister was speaking to we all want to have those questions answered because some people are incredibly powerful have a lot of influence and they are helping to determine the outcomes which are affecting us all and of course nothing happens in a vacuum it's not that the chancellor suddenly went into a kind of number 11 on his own and came up with these ideas so of course we want to know who's talking to who and in parliament of course we declare our interests we have our register of financial interests so people can scrutinize who our associations are with and that transparency is so important to ensure that people understand where we're coming from and the same should be true of think tanks of course so that we know where those influences really sit right let's go to another question dean is in abingdon hello dean hello ian nice to talk to you again Hi. Um, i'd like to ask the panel why is it so difficult for politicians to say we've got it wrong sorry we've got it wrong Possibly because on occasions when they have said that, they don't get any credit for it. I mean, there, there are other occasions when they do. But you think about Nick Clegg when he apologised for the tuition fee rises and did that um, statement saying he was sorry and then someone put it to music and everyone just sort of took the mickey out of him, didn't they? Um, 
David, have, well, you, have you ever got anything for saying you're sorry about something? I think it's always a good idea to acknowledge when things have gone wrong. And I can certainly see, you know, my time in, in local government, you go through a process, you think you've made the right decision, then something emerges that changes your position. I think one of the challenges that we see in national politics is it's always tempting to say to people when you disagree with their argument that they should apologise for being wrong. And actually, the vast majority of politicians are acting in good faith. They're trying to do the right thing. When they pursue a particular policy line, it's because they think it will benefit the wider population of the country. And actually, I don't think it's constructive if you get into a situation where every politician is always apologising for everything um, that they've done where they've made a mistake because you end up focusing so much on that that you actually lose the momentum to deliver the policy benefits that you're, you're seeking to do. Rachel? There is an issue with complacency as well, and I believe that's what we're seeing at this time when clearly there's been disturbance in the markets. We've we've all paid the price for that. And then to be so complacent to say we're just going to be like a juggernaut and continue as opposed to even diverting that policy. And therefore, I think it's absolutely right that when such a catastrophic impact has happened from a, a, a pronouncement that there is some stepping back from that. I mean, obviously, we saw the immediate... Re- you turn at the Conservative Party conference on the higher rate of tax, but we need to see um, further contrition from the government. And therefore, <clears throat> it's absolutely right that um, when something is so badly wrong, that there is an admission of that, because that would actually show that there is acknowledgement of what's happening at the moment, this complacency leads us all to believe that they simply just do not understand mm. the, the causation of, of, of the economic situation at the moment. I may have got this wrong. I may be misremembering it. But I think I had to apologise to you once. But maybe it wasn't you. It was a, an interview I did with, I think it was you, about Brexit. And you said something and I accused you of lying. Or whoever it was I interviewed, I accused of lying. And it, 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 I can't even remember the, the context now. Um, and shall we say there was a complaint made about my uh, demeanour in that. And I did apologise on air. And I, because I thought that was the right thing to do. Do you remember this? Was it you? I don't think it was me, <laughs> but, <laughs> but oh, I think well. we, I think everyone should apologise for Brexit. So uh, there we are. Um, Emily, do politicians answer the question? Why is it so hard for politicians to just admit they get it wrong? I don't know. I think we're quite demanding as a public in terms of this. Do you think we're more demanding than other? Only countries? in terms, only in terms of the fact that we seem to hunt down politicians and try to force them to U-turn on every policy and then we don't even give them credit when they do U-turn. So I don't envy politicians who are trying to uh, make policy. In some ways I think we're a little bit ungovernable. That is true, Adam. Uh, (laughs) Think about the U-turn that Liz trusted on the top rate of tax. She's had absolutely no credit for doing that whatsoever, did she? No. I think (laughs) think sometimes it's necessary and right to make an apology, but it rarely makes the situation better for a politician. And Boris Johnson, I think, was in particular, was very resistant to... Yeah, but he never apologies. meant his apologies. That was the problem. No. And, and when he did... He, he He'd actually was, go around telling people that he didn't mean his apology and indeed, he didn't understand yeah. why in, he in should apologise. In the tea room after, yeah. after being in the House of Commons. But he spent most of his career refusing to make apologies. And at, right at the end, he, he did make a couple of apologies over Partygate. It didn't really do him any favours in the end. Uh, but sometimes I think it is just necessary. And I think it's, it's better to do it sooner rather than later. Yeah. Yeah, if you're going to do it, do it soon. Right, we have 15 more minutes, or just under 15 minutes to go. If you'd like to ask a question to our panel, uh, let's introduce a couple of different subjects. I think um, we, we've done quite a lot on, on Liz Truss, etc. But uh, that's, I have to tell you, that's what people want to talk about. So, But I'm happy to take another subject if you'd like to provide me with one. It's 8.47. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. This is Energy and Industrial Strategy Secretary Jacob Rees-Mogg. Last week, the chief executive of Shell said there's almost a moral responsibility for that company to pay more in tax. Are you still viscerally opposed to windfall taxes on these companies? If people want to pay more tax, they can. If the chief executive of Shell wants to pay more tax, let him. But why wouldn't the government welcome. encourage him so to do? Well, because you have to set tax rates that encourage investment and are fair for the economy as a whole. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. With Motorway, where dealers compete to give you their best price for your car. LBC. I'm
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Nine minutes to nine on LBC. Emily Carver, Adam Bienkoff, Rachel Maskell and David Simmons with us taking your calls. Simon is in Southampton. Hello, Simon. Hi, Ian. Vladimir Putin has announced that he's prepared to sell the uh, sell gas to the West again, or the EU. Is he having a laugh? <laughs> um, OK. Why, why, do you think he, why do you think he's doing this? Well, surely, surely, well, probably because he's running out of money, but... Uh, I mean, surely to goodness, we would not buy that poison. Well, I don't think Obviously. we would, because we only have a, I think we only got 7% of our gas from Russia anyway, but there might be some European countries that think, well, hang on a minute, we need to... Uh, we, our citizens need this gas over the winter, but the EU has been quite trenchant on this, David Simmons. Yeah, I, I think across Europe there's been a lot of solidarity, and we know that the UK has been extracting a lot of gas, in particular from the North Sea, working with Norway and then pumping that into storage facilities in Europe to try and give them as much resilience as we can across the winter. But I think we'd be, we'd be fools to take that offer from Putin at the moment. We know that historically the Russian government is almost the opposite of us. They always run a big budget surplus, which gave them more financial resilience. This suggests perhaps that sanctions are really beginning to bite. They probably want another injection of cash to carry on fighting the war. And they'd like to re-establish the dependence of countries like Germany, which have a very big gas infrastructure uh, on Russian supplies. Clearly, that would call into question the whole ability of Europe and our allies around the world to defend the values that we've set out in Ukraine. And it would be very unwise to go down that route. Adam? I think it's pretty unlikely we see a wholesale return to the sort of relationship between Russia and, and Europe that there was in the past. But I think if anything good has come out, could have come out of this crisis, it's that the West realises that it shouldn't be dependent on Russian gas and fossil fuels more generally and move to a sort of more, much bigger reliance on renewable energy. Unfortunately, that's not what we've been seeing from this government under this trust, who seem determined to, I mean, the, the most that Liz Truss has said about renewable energy so far is about banning solar farms. And um, we're also in the process of negotiating a big new uh, long-term gas deal with Norway. Um, so it doesn't seem like the government is really seizing the opportunity that this moment is actually supplying. Emily. Well, the thing is with renewables, uh, you know, I would say the vast, vast majority of the public would like to see us move to more renewables. That is true. But at this moment in time, unfortunately, we still need oil and gas, which unfortunately are fossil fuels. So any, you know, molecule of oil and gas that you uh, dig up or produce in this country is one that you don't import from regimes like Russia. So I think there needs to be a balance because at the end of the day, we've seen what's happened with energy prices. And the most important thing is security of supply at the moment. And if that means that we don't import so but much, the, the idea that but rather create it here, then I think that's something that a lot of people would support. I think the idea that the fracking is going to lead to any real reduction in energy prices in the short or even medium term, I think it's, it's for the I don't think anybody's Well, there's the North Sea as well and so on, well, you know. Well, that, that, I mean, that, that's Liz Truss's agenda, is that she says we need yeah. to get fracking and that's but, going to, but in the that's long, going to ensure... I mean, I, I'm not... I'm slightly on the fence on fracking, but, I mean, if you think, if it can be proven that over the long term, by which I mean 10, 15 years, that a degree of fracking could reduce bills by... Even if it's a low percentage, but, surely it's worth investigating. Well, where is the evidence of that? Well, I mean, there's, we, we, there, there we is haven't, no evidence we haven't got any evidence at the moment. I mean, That's the Conservative the MPs don't even want to support it. No, there is no local area where there is majority support for, for fracking, at least. I've seen no evidence of that. Whatsoever. Okay. Well, we're not going to get diverted onto fracking. Let's stick with uh, Vladimir Putin. Is Vladimir Putin mocking us, Rachel? No, I think I think it's showing that he's weakening and, and clearly economically he's trying to reach out because he is going to need to restock and, and resupply. And of course, his own home economy is, is very fragile indeed. But I think beyond that, Europe is incredibly strong in its resilience to Russia, but also has made its longer term objectives now about moving away from a carbon dependency on Russia into a more renewable future. And that's exactly what we have to do, picking up the issues of fracking. Of course, it's not going to be providing the uh, the energy supplies we need in the future because that needs to be invested in what ca we can bring on stream really fast, and that is the renewable sector. And that's why the investment needs to be there. And, and also moving into the electricity market 
create hydrogen, new opportunities there for us to become global leaders in in new sources of energy. So we can see this as an economic opportunity if we really want to put the research and development into the the renewable sources of the future. David, quick final one. Just worth mentioning that oil and gas are not just for energy, they are raw materials as well. So we use gas, for example, to make agricultural fertiliser, we use oil to make plastics, and big British oil, the likes of Shell and BP, are critical to the rollout of Britain's electric vehicle infrastructure. So the idea that we could simply turn wholesale away from companies like that, when they are critical to the long-term future of our economy and our ability to implement renewable energy as an agenda, uh, is, is wrong. We need to give them the right support to play the part that they, they do, both in resisting in the short term the impact of Putin's war and also moving Britain towards a more sustainable energy future. Right, uh, Simon, thank you for that. Quick final text question from Stu in Cumbria. Protesters from Just Stop Oil and Insulate Britain blocked Parliament Square earlier. If they'd done a similar thing during the morning for the Queen, they would have been removed in the blink of an eye. Why are they being left to cause disruption now? Rachel. Well, of course, it's really important that people have got that freedom to protest. It's something we're very proud of in our country, that people are on our streets speaking their voices freely. We look at Iran at the moment and we look at the um, the horrific scenes that are beaming into us of women standing up for their liberty in Iran and not having those rights to stand for the things that they believe in. And of course, when we have got a government which is talking about great investment in carbon fuels for a longer period of time, people are saying there is an alternative and they want their voice to be heard. And when governments don't listen, people turn to the streets and that's exactly what's been happening in Westminster. But they don't have to block streets, do they, and cause massive inconvenience? How are they gaining support by doing that? There's all sorts of different ways of protesting and getting noticed because that's where your leverage falls and of yeah, course blocking they... ambulances is well, a nice, particularly nice way of getting your message across I mean it's totally undemocratic really isn't it you're preventing people from getting to work because you think that your ideas are better than everyone else's and it's just ludicrous and the police do seem to pick and choose when they're going to be heavy-handed, and I think Stu in Cumbria is absolutely right that uh, under some circumstances they would have been whisked off in handcuffs, but under others, not so much. Adam? I mean, we do still in this country, despite the best efforts of this government, have the right to, to protest. Mm. Um, and on the substance of the protest, I think organisations like Insulate Britain have been proven more right than wrong. Um, had the government uh, rolled out a lot more insulation over the last 10 years instead of rolling back some of those programmes, we would be much better prepared for this current crisis than we actually have been. David? In my view, it's not a protest. It's just disrupting people's lives. And every time they do it, it convinces those of us in the governing party that we need to be even more robust in challenging them. We don't get much more robust than that as an answer, do you? Um, Right, final fun text question from Becky in Truro. Think very carefully how you answer this one. As Cornwall gets ready for Britain's first space launch, which other panellist would you like to travel to space with? Or which other panellist wouldn't you like to travel to space with? Adam. Um, Well, I think I'd, I'd, I'd... Easily uh, travel with uh, David, given the, the incredibly calming. <laughs> oh no, to... I was going to go for David. <laughs> well, you're very popular. I have to go for Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, I'm going to keep my feet firmly on the ground. I think on this one. Oh, <laughs> oh you've got to enter into the spirit of it, David. I'm going to travel with you, Ian, because that will make it newsworthy. And that guarantees you an invite back. Well done all round. Uh, David Simmons, Rachel Maskell, Emily Carver and Adam Biankov, thank you very much for joining us over the last hour. If you ever miss an episode of Cross Question, you can catch up on the podcast or indeed on Global Player or the LBC YouTube channel. In a moment, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Should the coronation of King Charles be a cheap one? Or do you think we should go all guns blazing and do what we do best and have a right old bit of royal pageantry no matter what the cost? 0345 606 60973. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, Downing Street has warned of difficult decisions on public spending, despite the Prime Minister insisting she has absolutely no plans for cuts. Liz Truss told MPs she'd make sure taxpayers' money was well used. Today, 